Very good morning my dear students. I welcome to my 10th class. In fact, this is the last class as far as my subjects are concerned. I was discussing about uh, the design of uh, staircases and uh, the learning outcome of uh, the today's class is that uh, the students will be able to understand one complete example on the design of staircase including all provisions of uh, the detailing. So, I will just uh, rush through what has been covered uh, in the yesterday's class and uh, this is uh, what the contents of the syllabus. In fact, uh, all these things which I have highlighted in uh, red color has been covered in the previous class. I have given the introduction covering the general features, types of uh, staircases, different types of loads acting on the staircases, the concept of effective span according to IS uh, provision, distribution of loading especially in case of open well staircase and today we will be discussing uh, one example on staircase. So, before that a small glance through the things that have been covered starting from the definition of a staircase as to what this staircase is a component that simply connects uh, the two different uh, floors and these are uh, the different uh, parts of the staircases. What is important is to make out uh, what exactly the rise and the tread and uh, types of staircases have been covered and these are some of the photos we have seen and this is uh, the open well staircase and one with uh, intermediate flight and one without uh, intermediate flight and the examples of uh, other uh, staircases spiral staircase, geometric staircase and the riser and a tread type of staircase. This is another important classification that has been covered based on the type of the span. It can be a horizontally spanning or a transversely spanning staircase and we have one more called longitudinally spanning staircase. So, this is uh, what the details that has that have been covered in the last class. So, the detailing of reinforcement in case of transversely spanning staircase has been covered and you can see this is something like a simply supported uh, slab from center to center of the supporting elements. We define the transfer span and uh, this is uh, what the longitudinally spanning staircase is. The definition for the effective span in case the landing slab spans in the same direction as the stairs where landing slab and the flight both spans horizontally. We take the effective span as center to center distance between the walls or the bearings. So, this is for uh, the second case where the landing slab is uh, supported at it ends, but in the transverse direction or it could be the support covering all the three edges of the landing slab. In that case uh, we have seen this particular formula and this is uh, the third case that has been covered where the landing slab is totally different, but the flight is uh, supported by means of a landing beams and center to center of the landing beam is what the effective span. In fact, uh, the flight alone is uh, spanning in the longitudinal direction, but depending on the end condition the landing slab has to be designed. So, this is uh, what the concept of uh, detailing that has been covered and the concept of uh, the distribution of loads in a open well staircase when wherever we have the common area especially the corner at this point and at this point where you have uh, meeting of the two orthogonal flights. So, the load has to be hauled. In fact, this is another concept that has been covered uh, where the effective width will be increased by 75 mm provided the depth of embedment of the flight into the wall is more than 110 mm, where the loading for a width of 150 mm is reduced means we design the flight for slightly a lesser load and the load near the junction is not covered. So, these are all some of the guidelines we have seen as to what is the range of uh, rise to the tread. The ranges for the rise is from 150 mm to something like 180 mm as far as the tread is concerned, it varies from 220 mm to 250 mm this is for the residential building and if it is a public building we have seen that the rise can be reduced to 120 mm and it can go up to 150 mm whereas tread varies from 250 mm to 300 mm and we have this particular uh, relation tread plus 2 times of rise varying from 500 mm to 650 mm. We also have seen a uh, few other important uh, guidelines the number of uh, steps in each flight should not be greater than 12. And of course, the pitch should not be more than uh, 38 degrees and the headroom if we provide 
it is about uh, 2.1 meter and less. And we need to calculate the different loads for the design, the dead load, finished load, dead load of the step and of course, the imposed load which varies from 2 kilo Newton per meter square to something like uh, 5 to 6 kilo Newton per meter square in a heavy commercial building. We need to identify the maximum bending moment and the maximum shear force depending on the loading pattern and the depth of the slab has to be fixed from the deflection criteria and the staircase slab has to be designed as a conventional slab. In fact, the design of conventional slab has been covered by my colleague Dr. G. P. Chandradara. In fact, all those principles are very well valid in this case as well because the stair is nothing but the slab as a structure. All rules regarding the detailings are similar to that of the slab and enough development length and anchorage length for the steel should be provided. And this is what the design examples I just started in the yesterday's class. I will read the design again. Example, design a dog legged staircase for a residential building hall measuring 2.2 meter by 4.7 meter. Size of the hall is given here. The width of the landing is 1 meter. It is given, otherwise we need to assume in the range of 0.8 to 1.2 meter depending on the width of the hall. The distance between floor to floor is given 3.3 meter. The rise and thread is given 150 mm and 270 mm. Weight of the floor finish is given that is 1 kilo Newton per meter square and the grade of concrete is M20 and the steel is Fe415 and we need to sketch the details but the condition of the span. Here the flight and the landing slab spans in the same direction means flight spans longitudinally. So, this is uh, what the condition and depending on this condition we need to identify the effective width. <coughs> sorry, the effective span. Now, these are all the data given F C K is equal to 20 M P A, F Y is 4 on 5 M P A, width of the landing is 1 meter, height of the flight is 3.3 meter and size of the staircase hall as you can see here 2.2 meter by 3.7 R is 150 mm, T is 270 and here we are assuming the thickness of the wall as 200 mm. So, we can clearly see as to how our uh, staircase hall looks like in plan. We have two flights and this is how the support condition looks like. So, we have the wall supporting the landing and in fact, we have the parapet or the wall above also and as a result of that, this is not a simply supported case, it is a partially fixed case. So, in such situation, the bending moment uh, is not W L squared by 8 uh, and it is W L squared by 10 or W L squared by 12. You can even design for W L squared by 8, in fact, that moment is slightly higher and your design is going to be uneconomical. So, that is why knowing that it is a partial fixity case, it is better to design for W S squared by 10 as the moment. Let us uh, <coughs> proportion the stair and these are the given information R is 150, T is uh, 270 mm, H is 3.3. Uh, now, we have gone for two flights because it is a dog legged staircase consisting of two flights and height of each flight, we are assuming it to be same and that is why H 1 is equal to H 2 and that is equal to H by 2 and that is 3.3 meter by 2, it is 1.65 meter. Now, we need to identify the number of uh, steps and for that, the number of risers in each flight is to be identified. So, the height of each flight is uh, 1.65 meter, that is 1650 mm divided by 150 mm and that is equal to 11. So, 11 number of risers and obviously, the number of steps works out to be 11 minus of 1, that is 10. So, 10 steps that is what you see in the plan and width of the flight measured horizontally because of these 10 steps, uh, 10 into 270 being the tread value, so that it is 2700 mm. So, 2700 mm is nothing but the going of the flight. So, width of the hall is uh, 4700. So, obviously, 4700 minus of 2700, we have 2000 and if you divide that equally, at the two ends, it is 1 meter. So, that is what uh, the width of the landing equal to 1 meter and that is what is being specified in your problem also. Let the width of the step is uh, 1 meter. So, gap between the flight is 0.2 meter. So, definitely 2.2 meter is what the width uh, and taking the width of the step as 1 meter. So, we have a small gap of 200 mm in between the two flights. So, this is uh, what is uh, referred to as uh, the proportioning of the staircase. And with this proportioning, uh, let us see how our plan looks like. So, try to appreciate uh, the various uh, dimensions. 
plan 2.2 by 3.7 that is uh, the inner dimension as we can see here steps 1 to 10 and similarly from 11 to 20. So, this is uh, the width of the flight that is width of the step or even the width of the riser. So, that is 1000 meter and of course, this is what the width of the landing in the longitudinal direction. So, that is taken as 1 meter. So, that is 1000 mm, 1000 mm and 2700 mm is what the going is. So, the thickness of the wall is taken as 200 mm and uh, this is 2.2 meter internally. So, this is what the proportioning of the staircase as far as its plan details are concerned. Now, let us uh, fix the depth of the waste slab from the point of design. So, we know that uh, L by D the ratio of effective span to the effective depth uh, ratio is taken as 26 because I am assuming partial fixity it behaves as if it is a continuous uh, slab or a fixed slab otherwise we would have taken 20 and in between value can also be taken like 25 or even 24 depending on the situation, but here I have taken 26 therefore, L E the effective span works out to be 4700 plus uh, of the bearing on either side the wall is 200 mm. So, two bearing means one thickness of the wall. So, 4900 is what the effective span. So, therefore, effective span to depth ratio being 26. So, therefore, depth is equal to 4900 upon 26 it is 188 mm. So, we need to assume uh, some effective cover. So, we know that the nominal cover for the mild exposure is 20 mm and in fact, in slab we have only mine reinforcement and the distribution steel and assuming the mine steel as 10 mm dia. So, of the dia of the mine bar means the distance up to the center of the mine bar works out to be 20 plus 5 25. So, therefore, the overall depth of the slab. So, is nothing but 188 plus 25 that is 213 and that could be rounded off to 215. So, with this overall depth of 215 the effective depth works out to be 190 mm. Now, to, ident to identify the inclination of the flight. So, we have uh, this uh, information. So, I have the tread equal to 270, the rise equal to 150. So, the ratio of rise to the tread. So, this is uh, what the inclination theta. In fact, the same inclination is what the inclination of the flight also. So, from this triangle, so you can calculate as to what this hypotenuse is. So, under the root of uh, tread square plus rise square, if you calculate it is 309 mm. So, therefore, cos theta is nothing but uh, 0.874. So, you can also work out uh, the inclination theta and that theta should be less than uh, 38 degrees, but in this case it is around 30 degrees or so. Calculation of loads, dead load of waste slab in plan. So, we need to calculate the weight in plan. So, the thickness of the slab is uh, 215 mm. So, point 215 into 1 by 1 that is 1 meter by 1 meter is uh, what the area I have taken multiplying that with uh, 25. So, 25 kilo Newton per meter cube being the density of the concrete. So, you can even take it as 24000 or even 24500 kg per meter cube that is 24 to 24.5 or even 25. I have taken slightly onto the higher side 25 and this is what the load load because of the inclined. So, that has to be converted for the plan effect. So, that has to be divided by cos theta and if you do like that, we get the load as 6.14 kilo Newton meter square. So, this is very similar to the way we calculate the dead load in case of a normal slab, but only thing is that value is to be divided by cos theta. So, that we get the load intensity slightly higher because actual waste slab is inclined, but when that inclined waste slab is squeezed in the horizontal direction. So, the same load has to be kept over a smaller width obviously, the intensity of the load increases and that is 6.14. So, weight of all floor finishes acting horizontally has to be assumed it is given in the problem 1 kilo Newton per meter square. Now, the weight of the step is uh, the extra thing that comes. So, this will not be having in a normal slab. So, this r by 2 into 1 into into 24 being the density. So, that comes into picture. Now, you can see here. So, this is how I have taken the step here. The steps are like this and you can keep all these steps uh, one after the other and if you can see the equivalent thickness uh, is uh, the rise by 2. 
So, what we need to calculate is only the step weight, but to the same extent of the step we do not have the material. So, that is why if you take the average that is r by 2 being the average thickness. So, into 1 into 1 into 24 is what the dead load constituted by the steps and that is equal to 1.8 kilo Newton per meter square. And this is what the extra load we get in case of staircase and this is another correction as far as the dead load of the waste slab is concerned. So, except for these two things uh, we do not have any other uh, difference and of course, the imposed load is another one that has to be considered here. So, it is given 3 kilo Newton per meter square. So, therefore, the total load if you add all these things it works out to be 11 point uh, 94 kilo Newton per meter square. In fact, this is the working load or the allowable load or the service load. So, multiplying this with the load factor, the appropriate load factor of 1.5 for the limit state of collapse for the combination of all these dead load and live load is 1.5. So, therefore, the ultimate load is 17.91 kilo Newton per meter square. So, if you want you can round off this to something like 18 kilo Newton per meter square or you can even take that value itself. So, a calculation of the bending moment. In fact, uh, for the design I am considering the second flight where the flight has got two landing. A small change you have to do it for the first uh, flight where we have the landing onto one side and the other side is supported on the foundation. So, this is the intermediate uh, flight I am designing with uh, two landings where we have the partial fixity at the end of the landing with the wall. So, the bending moment as I told you W L squared by 10. The ultimate load comes into picture here. So, substituting W 17.91 kilo Newton per meter square, the span effective span 9.4.9 meter square by 10. So, we get the moment as 43 kilo Newton meter. Now, we have to check uh, for this moment for the depth assumed is ok or not or for the given depth uh, what is the ultimate load carrying capacity for the limiting condition. If that moment is more compared to this then it is a under reinforced section or we can also calculate as to what is the depth that is required for this 43 kilo Newton meter moment and if that depth is uh, less compared to what the depth that has been already given from the serviceability condition then the design is ok. But what I have done here is I have calculated the limiting uh, moment of resistance based on the balanced behavior. So, that is equal to Q B D square. In fact, the value of Q is uh, 2.76 for M20 concrete and Fe415 steel. So, into 1000 is what the value of B. So, for 1000 mm or 1 meter width we determine the reinforcement. 190 is what the effective depth square and 99.63 kilo Newton meter is what the critical moment or the balanced moment. So, since this is more than the design moment, so definitely the section is under reinforced. So, the depth provided is ok. In fact, you can reduce the depth, but you cannot do that because the slab fails in serviceability requirement from the point of deflection. But if you see here, the critical moment is 99, is almost 100 and uh, the actual moment is something like 43 and if you see this relation, so 40 means around 40 means 40 percent and this is 100 percent and we know that the total limiting steel for the balanced condition is 0 0.96 percent of the area. So, 0 0.96 percent is roughly 1 percent and if 1 percent is required for 99.64 which is almost 100, what might be the steel to carry this moment of 43. In fact, uh, steel and the moment is not linearly related, but still approximately we can identify the reinforcement is very close to 0.4 percent in this case. So, you can check that later once you get the reinforcement. So, it is better to have some idea as to what might be the percentage of steel we will be getting for this moment when it is compared with this critical moment. So, that when we get the answer we can just cross check. Now, this is uh, what the procedure for the calculation of uh, the reinforcement I go by the quadratic equation. So, I request the students to use this particular approach in the exam. We know that for the under reinforced uh, section, the moment of resistance corresponding to the ultimate condition is given by 0.87 FYAST into D minus FYAST divided by FCK B and that should be equated to the design moment 43 into 10 to the power of 6. Now, if you make proper substitution 0.87 FY is 4 and 5, AST is unknown that is to be determined. 
effective depth is 190 mm minus 4 on 5 AST not known divided by FCK is 20 mega Pascal and for a width of 1 meter where V is equal to 1000 mm and that is equated to the given moment 43 into 10 to the power of 6. So, you solve this uh, equation and we get the answer and before that the intermediate step what you get is this, this much of AST minus of 7.49 AST square equal to your moment. So, this can be written in this form. So, this is what the final quadratic equation. So, use your uh, calculator or you have the equation. So, substituting the relevant values of A, B and C. So, the answer can be determined. So, solving this your AST is 676 mm square. So, this is what the amount of reinforcement that is required. So, let us calculate the percentage of steel. In fact, this steel is for 1 meter. This is what the steel per meter expressing this as a percentage 100 AST by BD. So, we have 0 0.356, this 0.536 as I told you this is very close to 0.4 percent. Uh, in fact, the relation is not linear. If the relation were to be linear probably would have got very close to 0.4 since it is non-linear the value is rather close to 0.4, but it is less. So, percentage of the critical moment and the design moment has to be looked into and accordingly probable value of the percentage of steel for the design moment is to be estimated so that you can check the answer. So, this percentage is definitely less than PT limit being 0.96 percentage therefore, it is a under reinforced section. And if the grades of the materials are different and this critical uh, steel the limiting steel is different and all these uh, information you get it in uh, SP 16. So, we have few tables and those tables will give you all this information. So, you can refer to those tables and remember some of these values. So, to have this much of uh, reinforcement, so we will be providing 10 mm uh, dia at the spacing of uh, area of 1 diameter by the total area into 1000. So, with that we get 116.2 and this can be reduced to the lower value may be 115 or even 110. So, finally, provide as 10 at 110, this is what the reinforcement in the longitudinal direction and this spacing of 110 is less than 300 mm, it has to be less than 300 mm and it should be less than 3 times the effective depth of the slab because it is a mine reinforcement. If these two conditions are satisfied, so indirectly we are satisfying the cracking requirement. So, when we go to the check for cracking, since all these requirements are taken care of, so probably there may not be any cracking, but actual check for the cracking also has to be done later, but anyway that is not a part of this design. So, thus this is ok from the serviceability requirements for cracking. Now, whatever the steel uh, we have determined by the calculation, so we can also determine this by using uh, SP 16. In fact, we have two more approaches uh, to determine the reinforcement. So, just for the sake of uh, curiosity because students are expected to know the importance of SP 16. So, that is why I am using this SP 16 for different approaches. This is the second approach using the table 16 of the SP 16 which is a flexural table. MU by BD square is what uh, the parameter that is required. So, MU is uh, what the design moment is. So, I have put that 43 into 10 to the power of 6 divided by 1000 the width into effective depth square that is 1.19. So, this can be rounded off to 1.2 and we can refer to the table to corresponding to page 48 and the percentage of steel uh, is 0.359 percent. In fact, we are getting the same answer what we have got previously by calculation. So, by calculation it is 0.356 and here it is 0.359, a small uh, difference to the third decimal and that is not a big difference from the practical point of view. Again less than PT limit, so under reinforced section and AST we get 682 mm square. Now, for this 682, if you calculate the spacing, we get the same spacing as 110 mm center to center. So, provide as 10 at 110 mm center to center is what the steel is. So, this is uh, what the table uh, I was uh, mentioning, table 2 for the flexure, reinforcement percentage PT for the singly reinforced section, 
Normally, we use this uh, table for the design of beams, singly reinforced beam. So, this can also be used for the design of slabs and that is the reason why I have taken this as an example. So, our mu by b d square is uh, 1.2 after the rounding off and corresponding to that the percentage of steel is 0.359 and that is what the value we have used here and corresponding to this mu by b d square. So, this is uh, another approach. In fact, we have set of tables uh, made available in your uh, SP 16 also, where we will be able to pick up the diameter and the spacing of the rod straight away corresponding to the overall depth of the slab and again for the design moment. But in this problem, the design moment is uh, 43, but the overall depth of the slab is uh, 225. In fact, uh, such type of tables are uh, developed for different combinations of uh, the concrete grid and the steel grid. So, we have to look for the appropriate graph. So, the graph from SP 16 is there in table 43 that is relevant to this particular problem page 79. So, what that particular graph is. So, this is what the graph. In fact, uh, so the scanned information is not that clear, but you can make out this table 43. In fact, these are all some of the things you find in your SP 16. So, you go to table 43 corresponding to your uh, FCK 20 Newton per mm square, FY is 415 and of course, the thickness of the slab, overall thickness of the slab is 225. So, what the thickness we have is slightly less and 215 is uh, the thickness here, overall thickness, but we do not have a table corresponding to 215 mm but I am going to 225 mm thickness. So, otherwise we have to look for 200 mm thickness. So, this is a small uh, change or a small variation we will be having and your answer might be slightly different compared to the answer what we have got in the previous cases. And with this uh, again for 10 mm diameter bar and going under that, so we have the different values of the moment and our moment is uh, in the range of uh, 41 to 45 and corresponding to our value. So, our moment as you know is uh, 43 kilo Newton meter. So, corresponding to that 43, you can see that 43 lying between 41 and 45 and in between that is what the value we have to pick, we have to interpolate it actually and when you go horizontally, it is in between 12 and 13. So, 12 and 13 is what the bar spacing in centimeter, but when you convert that to mm, it is from 120 to something like 130. So, I have done the interpolation and with that interpolation, so your answer is going to be like this. Again, hash 10 at 110 is ok. And again, the same percentage of steel like 0.38 percent, which is less than PT limit 0.96 percent, therefore, it is ok. So, any of uh, these approaches we can use it in practice, but uh, in examination, uh, so it is better we go by the fundamental. So, where uh, we will be using that quadratic equation and EST can be obtained in terms of mm square and later assuming the diameter of the bar, the spacing can be determined. Now, let us uh, design the distribution steel. The distribution steel is 0.12 percent of the gross area because we are going for HOSD type of bars, otherwise we have used 0.15 percent if it is a mild steel. So, 0.12 into BD, so B being 1000, overall depth is 215 upon 100, it is 258 mm square. In fact, this is what the steel again per meter width of the slab. So, therefore, we can calculate the spacing assuming uh, some diameter. So, normally the diameter is 6 to 10 uh, mm, but here I have uh, gone for 8 mm uh, ribbed bar HYSD type. So, that uh, the area being 50 pi d square by 4 is 50 mm square upon the total area 258 into 1000 the width small b. So, we get 190 mm center to center. So, provide hash 8 at 190 mm center to center where that spacing should not be more than 450 mm and at the same time it should not be more than 5 times the effective depth of the slab. So, therefore, the spacing of 190 less than 450 mm less than 5 times the effective depth it is ok again from the serviceability consideration as far as cracking is concerned. Let us go to the design for shear. So, we have to calculate uh, the shear force. 
the ultimate shear force VU is W L E by 2. So, this is what the formula for simply supported case. In fact, 50 percent goes to the support. So, that is what the thing is. So, in case uh, the loading pattern is different as we have in case of a open well or a open evil case, then you have to simply calculate the reaction at the support and the maximum reaction is nothing but the shear force. Here I am using the formula because of the symmetry in the structure and also symmetry in the load. So, W is 17.91, 4.9 is what the span is upon 2, 43.88 kilo Newton is what the shear force near the support. So, therefore, tau V, the nominal shear, the nominal shear is uh, V u divided by B d, that is what the stress. So, V u is 43.88 into 1000, 10 cube or 1000 divided by B is 1000 and again 190 is what the effective depth. With that, we get a small value of shear 0.23 MPa and we need to compare whether the shear is less than the allowable shear the allowable shear in the concrete. The allowable shear in the concrete is again a function of steel that is 100 AST by BD and that shear has to be increased marginally in case of slab. So, that has been covered in your slab problem. KS comes into picture as an additional factor in case of slab design. So, PT in this problem is 0.35 and corresponding to this 0.35 percent 100 AST by BD and if you see IS456 corresponding to our M20 concrete. So, the tau C value can be calculated and that is equal to 0.41 Newton per mm square. So, this 0.41 Newton per mm square has to be compared with so this value 0.23, but in fact this 0.41 has to be further increased by multiplying this with KS factor and uh, how to determine this KS factor has been explained in the design of slab. So, that is why I am not going into the detail. So, K s depending on the depth of the slab in your uh, IS 456. Uh, so, if you interpolate it for the depth uh, 215, we get 1.18. So, therefore, uh, the shear resisted by the concrete or the shear strength of the concrete is uh, now 1.18 into 0.41. So, in fact, uh, the actual shear, the nominal shear stress 0.23 is less compared to to see itself. So, 1.18 of that is still a higher value, we really need not have to worry about uh, the shear in slab. So, by chance if the shear in the slab is more than this uh, uh, shear resisted by the concrete, then the thickness of the slab has to be increased. So, that is the only alternative, otherwise we have to provide the shear reinforcement and providing shear reinforcement in slab is uh, slightly a complex uh, approach. So, best thing is to increase the depth and see that the slab is safe in shear, but usually slab is not going to be unsafe in shear. Now, check for the development length. So, provide enough development length at the junction of the flight and the landing and also necessary anchorage over the support as shown in the figure. So, the development length for uh, your uh, uh, diameter, so 415 grade uh, steel Fe 415. So, development length is 47 times 5 as long as you use M20 and FE415. So, 470 mm is what the development length that is required and this is to be checked near the junction. You can see in the detailing what exactly this development length is. And of course, near the support we need to extend the reinforcement by a length equal to LD by 3 from the face of the support into the wall or into the support. And if this anchorage, if you are not getting it, then we need to bend the bar into the depth of the slab. So, here it is hardly 160 mm, so this can be extended as a straight bar. So, LD by 3 is 160, the check near the end as an anchorage check and uh, at the junction of the landing and with the flight, so this is what the development length to be given. Check for deflection. Now, as the effective depth provided is uh, more than that required for uh, controlling the deflection, the slab is definitely safe in shear, but anyway, so we have this requirement L e by d available, what effective span to depth that is available after the design that should be less than L by d, the basic value that is suggested in the code multiplied with uh, 3 factors k 1 factor, k 2 factor and k 3 factor. These are called as uh, the modification factors. In fact, uh, these modification factors uh, 
will not come into picture except one which is K2, the factor associated with the tension reinforcement. In fact, K1 is uh, for the span only when the span is more than 10 meter. So, K1 factor comes into picture. So, here uh, there is not an issue and K3 factor comes uh, only if there is a compression reinforcement. So, that is uh, the problem in case of uh, W reinforced beams. And of course, you also have one more factor called as K4 factor uh, depending on the shape only when you have an L beam or a T beam that K4 factor comes into picture and that K4 factor uh, is equal to 1 in case you are dealing with uh, rectangular sections. So, straight away K1, K3 and of course, K4 can be eliminated and we have only K2 factor to be identified. So, this K2 factor depends on the percentage of steel provided and also it depends on the grade of the steel and the allowable stress in that steel comes into picture. So, to determine this uh, K2 factor, so, we have to see IS 456 2000, the figure 4 in page 38, the K factor works out to be 1.4. So, now substituting this uh, K factor, which is actually the K2 factor here. So, L by D available is 24.7. Therefore, this value on to the right hand side, 26 the basic value of 1 into 1.4 being the K2 into 1 that is K3. So, definitely 24.7 is less than this answer. So, therefore, it is safe in deflection. So, we can also work out as to what exactly the deflection for this particular slab, the elastic deflection and of course, the deflection with time which is a function of uh, the creep and shrinkage that can also be determined later at any particular instant of time. But this is uh, just a check to ensure that the deflection is safe, but the actual deflection can also be determined uh, for any particular condition of the loading for any age as well, but how to calculate this 1.4 from the graph. In fact, I have put that particular graph here. So, this is what the percentage of uh, reinforcement 0 0.4, 0 0.8 like that it goes and the first line corresponds to 0 0.2 percent and this is 0 0.4 percent. The central point corresponds to 0 0.3, but our value is 0 0.35 and from that 0 0.35, we have to go and pick up these lines all these nonlinear lines corresponds to the allowable stress in the steel, which is a function of the grade of the steel. Now, if you take a Fe 4 on 5 steel, that Fe 4 on 5, 4 on 5 has to be multiplied with uh, 0 0.58. So, 58 percent of the yield stress and of course, that is to be multiplied with uh, what is the steel that is required divided by what is the steel that has been provided. Assuming that the required and provided are same, so this ratio is 1, but ultimately it is 0 0.58 into Fy, Fy is 4 on 5 into 0 0.58, if we calculate it is 240. See where the 240 comes here, the 240 corresponds to the second graph from the bottom. So, we have to pick that second graph, so go over that graph and pick up the point corresponding to the percentage of steel provided that is 0 0.35 and go horizontally and pick up the modification factor. So, the modification factor is here exactly on this particular line and it is uh, between 1.2 to 1.6 and of course, the in between value is 1.4. So, that is what the value that has been used here 1.4. So, putting that value of 1.4 in fact, 26 into 1.4 is still higher, but the available L by D is 24 but the limiting value is much more than 26. Therefore, your slab is safe in deflection. Check for cracking. In fact, we are not doing any check for cracking. It is only the mention since all the detailing uh, requirements are uh, taken care of. So, the slab is safe in deflection. So, this is what uh, the sentence. As the detailing requirements with regard to the diameter spacing for the mine reinforcement and also the spacing for the distribution steel and the cover requirements for the slab has been satisfied according to the requirements of IS 456 2000. So, indirectly we have taken care of uh, the cracking provision. So, therefore, the cracking is assumed to be prevented indirectly and the slab is safe in serviceability requirements. So, let us see the detailing and before that, how to design the first flight. So, we have completed the design of the second flight where we have two landing, but in case of first flight, so we have only one landing. So, write that uh, 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 figure with one landing and uh, then put all the loads and then determine the bending moment. Since that is the only flight where all other flights are common, 
whatever the reinforcement we have uh, designed for uh, the intermediate flight can also be provided for the first flight. So, in case in the examination first flight alone is given, then uh, we need to identify the support condition. So, one of the landing will not be there and determine the reaction and then the bending moment and then go ahead with the design. So, this is uh, what you need to do as far as the design of the first flight or the gown flight is concerned. And if you calculate the effective span, so the effective span uh, will be less than 3.9 meter, bending moment and shear force will be less and the amount of reinforcement required also going to be less. Now, in case if you change the support condition, what happens? If at all there is a difference in the problem, it is only with respect to the support condition. Now, I will modify the support condition for the same problem and let us appreciate as to what happens to the effective span. So, in the present problem, the effective span uh, was uh, 4.7 meter, but now if I change the support condition, what is that support condition? If the flight is supported at the ends by means of a landing beam, so definitely the going is uh, what the effective span is. At the junction of the flight and the landing, we have uh, landing beams, therefore LE is 2700 mm, the distance between the first and the last riser. In fact, center to center distance between the landing beams, it is equal to the going. So, we need to design for 2.7 the flight, so span is less, bending moment is less, shear is less, the amount of reinforcement also is less in this particular problem. So, only the difference is that the landing slab has to be designed separately or the reinforcement has to be simply extended on into the landing and of course, the distribution still in the other direction has to be provided for the landing. Now, suppose if the condition is changed like this. Here the flight and the landing spans in the opposite direction. This is what uh, the other uh, condition is. Flight spans longitudinally and landing spans transversely. The landing design depends on the edge condition which I am not considering. As far as the flight is concerned, how to determine the effective span? The effective span of the flight in that situation is your going value plus of the width of the landing that is x and again off the width of the landing onto the other side that is y, but only thing is x and y should not be more than 1 meter. Our landing itself is uh, 1 meter, so therefore 2 x is 1 meter and 2 y is 1 meter with that x and y is half meter. So, therefore, the effective span is 2700 plus 500 plus 500, 3700 mm and that is equal to 3.7 meter. In fact, uh, the span is again less in this case. So, the amount of reinforcement also will be less in this problem. So, this is what uh, the detail of the plan going to be and this is how the reinforcement looks like this. I have taken both the flights. So, this is what the ground flight is and this is uh, the first flight. I have provided a small foundation for the ground flight 500 by 500 mm is what the dimension and you can see this dark line. The dark line is what the reinforcement at the bottom which is the tension extend the reinforcement as deep into the foundation as possible and then bend it vertically down and again we have to bend it into the foundation. And if you take that reinforcement into the landing, do not simply bend that reinforcement immediately, take it as deep into the landing as possible leaving the cover and then take it horizontally. So, this is uh, what is important. So, do not bend it immediately is what the rule, otherwise would have bent it immediately in the horizontal direction where reinforcement is really required at the bottom even for the landing slab also. Since we have not extended at the bottom, we need to put an extra bar at the bottom which is the design reinforcement for the landing, the same diameter and same spacing and extend further into the flight that is the weight slab and then bend it something like this. So, that the landing reinforcement and the reinforcement of the flight at the bottom has to cross each other and it has to go into the depth of the landing and the depth of the waste slab and further it has to get projected. What is that projection? And that projection is what the development length and that development length is to be calculated from the junction and you can see that is nothing but LD. So, that is 47 times the diameter, here the diameter is 10 mm, it is 470 on either side of this particular junction. But as far as the top flight is concerned, so we have the reinforcement again at the bottom of the flight. When you go to the top landing, extend that reinforcement further to the top and then take it horizontally. Again, a reinforcement at the bottom of the landing and it has to cross the main reinforcement and then it has to go into the flight by
by a distance again L day measured from the junction on either side. But what about here near the first landing of the second flight? So, the reinforcement at the bottom has to be provided and of course, the reinforcement at the top a small piece you have to provide and extend it further and then extend by maybe 150 mm into the flight. So, this is uh, what the type of detailing we need to look at. What important is to appreciate this crossing of the two reinforcement at the junction in the first flight near the landing and also in the second flight near this landing and a small change in the detailing at this junction. So, this is what the landing on this flight which is spanning longitudinally. By chance uh, if this condition is slightly different where uh, the flight is supported by means of a landing beam then the detailing is slightly different near the junction. I am not going into the details of all these things because the students will be studying all these things in greater detail when they go to the detailing class, but it is better to know that the detailing is slightly different in case of uh, the land in case of the flight supported by means of a landing beam. And this is uh, what we need not have to do and what we need to do it. So, this is the correct one and we should not do this one and because of the tension in the reinforcement. Uh, so, this particular portion of the concrete uh, cracks and this falls off and to avoid that we are making this uh, crossing over of the reinforcement and if required one extra bar has to be provided at the top as we see here. And if you have a straight staircase in the examination, the straight staircase can be given and depending on the condition again the effective span can be determined. But in the dark decorative staircase we have designed both the flights, but here we need to design only one flight. So, as usual provide the reinforcement with the same condition of the detailing near the junction. So, in conclusion the students have learnt today the following things types of staircases, the concept of effective span, the requirements of staircases, detailing requirements and the importance of development length and the anchorage and of course, one typical example including the drawing. Students with this uh, I come to the end of my class. I had to do all these things in a hurry because this happens to be the last class. So, I think uh, I have taken slightly uh, 2, 3 minutes extra, but I have gone in a hurry. So, only to see that I complete all these things. So, with this uh, I thank the students uh, for their patience listening. In case you have any doubts, you can call me over phone or you can send me the emails so that I can uh, clarify your doubts uh, through mail or by phone. Again, I take this opportunity to thank uh, all the members of PTU as a site for having given me this wonderful opportunity to share my experience. Thank you one and all.